Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. There's a principle, which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. Good evening. My name is Hugh I'm an alcoholic. I like to start off these little sermons with that quotation out of this book, out of a spiritual experience, for one fundamental reason. I have become convinced over the years that it is that contempt prior to investigation that causes us to give out a damn sight more 30-day chips in Alcoholics Anonymous than we do one-year birthday cakes. Contempt prior to investigation. And if some of you fellows aren't sure what contempt means, I'll tell you what it was for me. I felt that anyone that believed I was going to pattern my life after something thought up by a shyster New York stockbroker and a butt doctor from Ohio had another thing coming. Now, I would like to take a moment or two before I start talking and welcome you people to Alcoholics Anonymous, those of you who are fairly new, those of you who did not identify yourself here tonight, and tell you if no one has that you're part of a fellowship that has astounded science for a great many years. This is the largest group of people in the world who have found a way to go from adolescence to senility without ever bothering to pass through maturity, so welcome. And if some of you are having a little problem Quitting drinking, I would like to tell you that quitting drinking is like making love to a gorilla. And you are not through until a gorilla is through. But I'm sure that if you keep coming back, get yourself a sponsor, have him explain to you what's in this book, that your chances will be far greater than they would if you try to do it any other way. Now, I don't talk too much about what the drinking was like. And I've got three pretty good reasons for not. The first one is that I never developed a fascination for the LAPD version of the way I drank. I never got overly fond of my first wife's version of the way I drank. And I don't remember how I drank. And if you drank like me, the chances are you wouldn't remember much of it either. But I understand that it is not necessary to remember how I drank. It's only necessary to remember what happened in that last drunk as best I can. Now, I'm not saying this facetiously. I recently retired. And they sent me a record of my work. And if anyone would have asked me when I went to work, I would have said it was in the summer of 1960, along about August. When I got the work record back, I found out I went to work in August of 1959. And I have absolutely no memory of that year. Vague, faint memories, but they don't mean much. But apparently I was able to work, even drunk, even in a continuous blackout. In the summer of 1960, I ended up in the North Hollywood group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I got there, I thought it was a home for out-of-work actors. And I found out I was pretty right about that. It was a home for out-of-work actors. But they were sober. And each one of them had something that I didn't fully understand. They had a way of talking that was somewhat unique. I got myself what you people today laughingly call a sponsor. Back then we called them adversaries. And uh, he made a suggestion to me. Now, there's quite a few things about this book that are very important. One of them is to go to a meeting someplace where they make an offer about the book. And the offer will generally go something like this. If you'll see the secretary or someone else when the meeting is over, they'll see you leave with this book on your terms. And I'd advise you to take them up on that and get this book on your terms. Because I'm convinced it will be the last damn thing you're ever going to get now while it's anonymous on your terms. So get that one out of the way to start that offer, incidentally, was not made to me. This adversary of mine said to me one day, he said, I've heard your story. I think you're a thief. We have a book around here for sale, and I want you to buy the book. And if I see you with the book without a receipt, I'm going to call on and have you arrested. So I bought the book, showed him the receipt, and started to read the damn thing. And I read it exactly the way you read a law book, looking for the loopholes. And there are a hell of a lot of loopholes in this book. Except when to do so would injure them or others. Now, that's a beautiful loophole. We are not saints. That's a wonderful loophole. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. Ends in a chapter 11 by saying our book is meant to be suggestive only. Now that suggestive is a beautiful loophole. And you tell suggestive to an alcoholic and he thinks he can run wild. Let me translate that word for you. 
What it really means is you damn well better. Now, I used to have a friend of mine who was teaching skydiving up at Mojave Airport, and he had a little acrylic tag made up, and he put on the rings of all the parachutes. And what it said was, this ring is meant to be suggestive only. He said he never had any problem with anybody ever following that suggestion, or at least ever come back to complain about it if they didn't. And if you think that your life is not as important to you right now as it was on the ring of that parachute, you're kidding only yourself. Your life's on the line. And how well you follow these suggested steps will determine how long you will live comfortably, happily, and sober. Because while you may not know it, you have done one thing that you could regret the longest day you live. You have come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and while we cannot keep you sober, we will fuck up your drinking like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> now, I'm going to assume you got yourself a pretty good sponsor, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that. What I'm going to tell you about is what I have learned from this book and this way of life in the last almost 28 years. I want to talk about the book as I understand it, as it applies to me. And because I don't think I'm new, unique, it's going to be as it applies to you also. When you read the doctor's opinion in this book, you'll probably be reading one of the most graphic explanations of alcoholism I have ever read. And I've read many books, articles, and treaties written by some very learned people who obviously don't know a first damn thing about alcoholism. And every one of them either try to explain, extend, or elaborate on what Sopor put in this book almost 50 years ago. And you know what he said about us? He said men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And while its effect is injurious, it is so elusive that we soon cannot differentiate between the true and the false, and we become convinced that our alcoholic life is the only normal one. I'll tell you a remarkable thing about that. If you're convinced that your alcoholic life or any other kind of life you're living is the only normal way life should be lived, you'll find one thing happens. No matter what goes wrong, it's never your fault. It's your fault. His fault. Their fault. But it isn't yours. After all, you're living the only way life should normally be lived. Now, what about this effect produced by alcohol? Did you ever ask yourself what that is? You think that's jails, hospitals, DTs, fights? No. No, no. You'll hear it from a lot of people, even newcomers who don't quite understand what they're saying. Alcohol affects the ego of an alcoholic as nothing else does. It tells him how good he is. He's a good dancer. He's a good car driver. He's good at everything he does when he has those few drinks. And for a while, this is true. And you'll find that alcohol is somewhat, and I don't mean to insult you girls, but it's somewhat like a woman. It builds you up. It tells you how wonderful you are. And just when you're beginning to believe it, it clips you from the blind side. <laughs> Knocks you right down to your knees. And you're like a quarterback playing on a football team and his own backfield is clipping him and he don't know what the hell they're doing to it. And you'll find that you will look for women who will do the same thing for you that alcohol done for you and pray to God you never find one. Because she will do the same thing to you that alcohol done. And anyone or anything that builds up your ego is the worst enemy you've got. And you will find that out if you haven't already. That's what alcohol does for us. And I'll tell you one other thing. The only known cause of alcoholism is alcohol. Women do not cause alcoholism. Did you ever drink a woman? No. Alcohol causes alcoholism. In its various forms, it will cause this craving to develop in one out of ten that drink it. And it makes no difference whether you're young, old, rich, poor, handsome, ugly. It makes no difference. Alcoholics Anonymous will work for everyone. Young, poor, rich, old. If you keep it simple, it will work. Now, it must be obvious to each and every one of you that it does not grow hair. So it's not a panacea. But what it is is the way an alcoholic can learn to live so that he can enjoy being sober. There's one line in this book that very few people ever say, and some of you may never have heard it, but it's extremely important. It says, laying the drink question aside, we can see where our way of life would have been wholly unsatisfactory. And that's what this book's about. It's about altering your way of life so that it is now satisfactory. But I didn't say changing it. That's not what I said. Many people come into Alcoholics Anonymous and spend a great long time trying to change their life. Why did you drink? Why did you take drugs? 
Why did you do these things? So you could change your damn life, didn't you? Was it successful? You see, Alcoholics Anonymous is going to show you how to be you. Did you ever try that before? Did you ever walk in the bar and say, give me a double shot tonight, I'm going to be me? Hell no, you don't. You become an actor, a director, and if you're real lucky, a talent scout or a casting agent. That's why you drink, is to be what you are not. And it wouldn't make any difference what you were. You would not want to be that. Because alcoholics are bodily and mentally different from their fellows. So no matter what you were, it wouldn't make any difference. If you had poor parents, it was because you didn't have rich ones. If you had rich ones, it was because they didn't pay no attention to you. And you'll overlook the true cause. You're drunk. You're a user. But you won't look at that. I didn't. For a long time, I didn't look at that. Hell no. I used to tell my first wife, well, I didn't tell her this but two or three times. I, I told her, I said, you know, if I'd have had a bad heart, you wouldn't have treated me like you did. She said, if you'd have peed on my divan, I would have. And quite often, we have to take a look at our actions and see what they were that caused other people to not care about us. You're going to be told to make a resentment list. A list of all the people you resent. I'm going to tell you something else. It ain't in this book, I'm going to tell you anyway. When you get all through with that, make a list of the people who resent you. And you might find out that you've got a hell of a lot longer list there than you did the other place. Because we really did not endear ourselves to the people we run in contact with. We didn't make an awful lot of friends out there. There's now a way to make them in here. And then Silkworth went on to say that we're restless, irritable, and discontented unless we can have few drinks like we see others taking with impunity. And we know that those few drinks will bring that sense of ease and comfort. But once we succumb to the desire again, as so many do, the phenomena of craving develops, and we pass through the well-known stages of a spree emerging remorseful with a firm resolve never to drink again. And that this will happen over and over and over. And unless we can experience some kind of a complete psychic change, there is very little hope for our recovery. Now, the next paragraph in the doctor's opinion offers you a lot of hope. But I had to buy this book and read it. And if you want to find out what it is, you can buy your own damn book and read it, because I ain't going to tell you what it is. Now, I'm going to tell you about chapter 2 and 3. When you read those two chapters, and I'm going to skip over one tonight, but when you read those two chapters, and starting there, you'll be reading only about the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when you read chapters 2 and 3, you'll be reading only about step 1. No more and no less. Did you ever read that step? There was one word in that step that I simply did not like. I thought all I had to do was admit I'm an alcoholic. Hell, I do that on the way to end of a bar. You know what the step says? We admit as we were powerless over alcohol. That our lives have become unmanageable. I'd like to point out to you right now, there's no and in there. Your life was unmanageable because of your drinking or using or whatever the hell else you was doing. That's why your life was unmanageable. You couldn't take care of you no more. Powerless. I didn't want to admit that. Hell, I'd made and spent $963,000 before I got in this way of life. And I've been given one of the biggest medals I can hang around a soldier's neck. And there's no way he was going to convince me I was powerless over anything or anyone. People were a commodity. I bought and sold them like anything else. The fact that I was sleeping in a cardboard box at the time was incidental. Really had nothing to do with it. <laughs> when you read Chapter 4, We Agnostics, you'll be reading only about Step 2. No more, no less. And the first paragraph is very important in that one chapter. Because it says in the preceding chapters you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope. We have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. And they're not talking now about the alcoholic and the non-drinker but the alcoholic and the heavy drinker. And what is the difference between them? And they tell you in chapter 2 that the heavy drinker, given sufficient reason, can quit. Problems of family, job, money, health, all of these are reasons for him to quit. Were they reasons for us to quit? Could we? No. Most of us really believe there was no way to quit. But the heavy drinker, he can quit. And then, oddly enough, he lists the only two symptoms that are listed anywhere in this book and anywhere in this program for alcoholism. There are only two. He says, if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when you're drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. 
If this be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Now, would you tell me now why so many people waste so much of their time trying to become emotionally stable and have so little to do with a spiritual way of life? I'm going to tell you something about this book. In the very beginning of it, in this doctor's opinion, for instance, they tell you that we feel that any description of the alcoholic that leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. And a little later in this meeting tonight, we're going to give out a few cakes. And I want you to know we give out those cakes for physical sobriety. And when you listen to the people take them, you will find out that it is obvious we do not give them out for emotional stability. If we did, we could save a hell of a lot of money. I know of at least one cake they could save here tonight. Could they keep? Now, you can be naughty as a fruit cake as long as you don't take a drink. You come back next year, they'll give you another cake with another candle on it. But try to become emotionally stable. And watch what happens to your mind when it begins to wave goodbye and leave. Be yourself. The changes that are necessary will happen slowly, most of the time, sometimes quickly, but that's rare. But they will happen. That's the promise. And it will come true. Now, I was not an atheist or agnostic when I come into Alcoholics Anonymous. I was born and raised in southern Missouri in a Baptist Bible Belt, and there has never been a case of atheism back there in that part of the country yet. I believed in God and Jesus Christ then, and I still do. That has not changed one little bit. And I've had a lot of people tell me that mentioning God or Christ from podiums like this to people like you is going to drive some of you drunks out of here. It might. But booze will drive you back. So in the end, we're going to break even. Now, if you don't like to hear about a power greater than yourself, a higher power, or God, then for heaven's sakes, don't read this book, because you'll find it's mentioned some 228 plus times. And if you don't want to hear about Satan or Christ, don't read page 11, because both of them are mentioned on that one page. In fact, it might be necessary for you to try to find another way to stay sober. And after you fail miserably, if you survive, you come on back and we'll talk about this spiritual concept that AA has become so world famous for in the last 50 plus years. Spiritual, not religious now, but spiritual. On page 52 in this book, there are eight results of being either atheist, agnostic, or egoist. I didn't say egotist, even though some people say in my case that too would have applied. What I said was egoist. You know what an egoist is? An egoist is a person that while he knows all about God, he believes only in himself. And if you believe only in yourself, you will think only of yourself. And if you ever feel any kind of pity at all, it will always be self-pity because you'll be living in a room full of mirrors by this time and every human emotion that goes out bounces right back. You will never see the concerns, illnesses, troubles of others. They're incidental. Who gives a damn? That isn't my problem. That's their problem. You'll hear this all the time. Well, is it? Or not. Maybe we'll find out before the evening, so. Now, you'll find a lot of people who will come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and the first thing they start doing is seeking something called self-esteem, self-worth. You ever heard those words? I want self-esteem. I have no feeling of value whatsoever. Self-esteem. Self-worth. You know what this book says about that? It says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. It doesn't say one damn word in there about self-improvement. Oh, esteem is important. But what esteem do you hold me in? What am I worth to you? That's the only kind of esteem and worth worth having. Because when you get this self-esteem you seem to want so badly, or this self-worth, what will happen is what has happened so many times to so many others. It will turn into conceit and arrogance. And you'll be right back where you started, trying to figure out what happened this time. But you'll be boosting that old ego up, trying to think you're more than what you are. Be yourself, whatever the hell that is. Then you never have to apologize for anything. You're just you. And then if anybody's dumb enough to hang out with you, they know what they're going to get to start with, don't they? So you don't have to apologize no more. Just be yourself. And when you are being yourself, you are being what God meant for you to be. That makes you perfect in God's eyes. You will never be perfect in yours or mine. But is that important anyway? 
God's what's important. Not me or you. Did you ever read that second step? It says, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. You know how many people go absolutely dingy trying to become a power greater than themselves and fail miserably? Even after many years of sober, they go absolutely stark raven mad because they are no greater power than they were, and I'm not. Neither was Christ. You know, he said of myself, I am nothing. Of myself, I am nothing. I have no more emotional strength today than I had 30 years ago today. I have a different source of strength than I had 30 years ago today. But it's not emotional. It's spiritual. Now, I said there were eight results on that page. I also said I had to buy this book and read them, so if you want to find out what they are, you can buy your own damn book and read them, because I ain't going to tell you what they are. Well, there were two of them, are, though. One of them says we could not control our emotional nature. One of them says we were having trouble in our personal relationships. Beautiful word, relationships. You know where else relationships is graphically mentioned in this book? In chapter 11, where it says, See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. Now tell me, fellas, is it possible most of the time these relationships went to hell so quickly because we went into them with what's in it for me? What can I get out of it? And we never even existed. We never even had a chance. Is it possible? I think it's something that every one of us should look at from time to time, don't you? The next chapter in this book is entitled, How It Works. Did you ever ask an old-timer in AA how it works, and he says, trust God and clean house? You want to know where you got it? Out of chapter 7, Working With Others. Which has burned the idea into the consciousness of every man that he too can get well, regardless of anyone. The only condition being that he trusts in God and clean house. Now before I get into that, the significance of that in anyway, this one chapter, there's something else I'd like to dwell on for a minute, and that's a small portion of chapter 5 we read in all of our meetings, or most of them out here. You know, they're reading that all over the country now, every place I've been, they're reading that. All over, from one end of this country to the other, that small portion of chapter 5. They don't know why they're reading it, but they're reading it. We've sent enough missionaries out among the heathens to convince them our way is the best way. But let me tell you what's wrong with it. When you hear it read in every meeting, you don't pay one damn bit of attention to what's being read. You've heard people say you can work this program any way you want to. Maybe you can. You know what the book says? Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And there is no S on path. Only one. It says there are two kinds of people who ain't going to make it. Those who cannot, or will not, completely give themselves to this simple program. Now they're talking about the smart ass and the wet brain. The next time one of you have a little drinky poo, or some of you fire off some of them pocket rockets you carry around with you, and you're sitting out here on a street corner trying to figure out which one you are, I want to tell you right now, a wet brain can't think. You'll know which one you are, I just told you. Do you ever anybody say, if you want what we have? Do you know that is the philosophy of a thief, and it is not a part of the AA way of life, and it is not in this book? you know what it does say? If you have decided you want what we have, and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. Then you're ready. Have you made that decision? Do you want it? Are you willing to go to any length to get it? If not, you ain't going to get it. What you will get is a whole bunch of little technicolored buttons they pass out in these meetings to wear on your keychain. You might even get a cake or two with a candle on it, but you know what you will not get? Peace of mind, contentment, hope, serenity. These things will be elusive. They just won't be there. Always looking, never find it. At some of these, we bought. Alcoholics Anonymous has 12 steps. Christ had 12 disciples. One of his disciples was Judas. One of these steps is Judas. Don't make any difference what number it is. It's the one step you really believe you don't have to take. That's the Judas step. It's the one step you said, that don't apply to me, I don't have to do that. That's the one that'll throw you always. That's the one that'll have you coming back drunk again. All because you weren't fearless and thorough from the very start. 
All because of that. Just like back there in step two. You know how many people want to be restored to sanity, don't want to come to believe? My God, we make psychiatrists, doctors, counselors wealthy. Trying to tell us how to be restored to sanity without coming to believe. We go nutty as a fruitcake, they get all our money and go away. Now, there's one other thing in there that's caused a lot of problems over the years. There are those two who are bravely, emotionally, and mentally ill, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. You know how many people have been deluded into believing that honesty is an effective treatment for a severe emotional or mental dysfunction, and have ended up killing themselves or someone else after several years because they would not seek out trained medical help? We're not doctors. We're a bunch of drunks. We're a bunch of misfits trying to help one another stay sober. If you need some kind of physical help from somebody who's trained to give it, for God's sakes, ask them. Would you go to a doctor if you had a legal problem? If you're sober, you should know who to go to to find the solution to the problem you're having. Be a doctor, lawyer, whatever the hell it is. Don't ever go to a sponsor and say, what should I do about this? He'll give you some bad advice every time. Go to him and ask him what he did when he is where you were, or when he's worse where you are. Now, if they were a good sponsor, I'll tell you. Just say, I don't know. Why don't you go talk to Joe or Harry or Frank or one of these people who have solved this? They'll tell you what they did. I ain't been there. Now, it's true that over a period of years, we sure as hell cause a lot of problems for ourselves that we do solve to stay sober. But do you think any one of us knows all of the solutions to all of the problems of this world? What, my God, would give us that belief except our own damnable ego once again? Did you ever try to figure out how high is up or how long is a piece of string? You know, some of you newcomers can ask some of the damnedest questions I ever heard. I haven't figured them out. I went to my sponsor once telling him all my problems. He looked at me and said, you got a job. I said, no, I haven't. He said, go to work. I ain't going to talk to you until you get a job. Went and got a job, worked for three or four weeks, found out almost all my problems disappeared. Found the solution. He said, if you think I'm going to sit around, you're going to sit around eight hours thinking of problems for me to solve while I work eight hours supporting my family, you're out of your damn mind. And he gave me the simple solution. But when I come to step five, you know what he told me? He said, I love, I can't answer all these things in here that you've come up with. He says, why don't you go talk to Father so-and-so? I said, well, I'm a Baptist. He's a Catholic. He said, what's the difference? All you want to know is a solution, don't you? You see, he had the brains to send me where I needed to go. He never tried to answer a question he didn't know the answer to. Did you ever try to describe a place you ain't never been? Pretty damn hard, isn't it? you got to be a hell of a con man to do it, and the other guy better never have been there. Most of us don't even know what honesty is. I thought I did. <clears throat> I knew what dishonesty was, or I didn't know what honesty was. I made the mistake of asking Blake one day if he'd mind explaining to me this word honesty. And he never answered a question to anybody ever. What he'd always do is ask you a question so when you knew the answer to his question, you knew the answer to yours. He got out of a lot of work that way, that guy did. And he said, let's assume, young man, that there was a man and a woman who were both married to someone else and they go to a motel together. And they go up to register and the desk clerk looks at him and he says, are you married? And they say, yes, we are. He gives them a key, they go inside. He said, now you tell me how must he would have applied to that. I hadn't been in that position for a while at that time, and it didn't sound like such a bad idea to me, but hell, it was obvious. I said, well, yeah, they'd have, they said, yeah, we're married, but not to each other. He said, no, that has absolutely nothing to do with honesty. He said, it certainly would have been a truth, though, wouldn't it? And it would have eliminated a sin of omission, but it has nothing to do with honesty. And for three months, I tried to figure that damn thing out. Never did get the answer to it on my own. Went up to him one day in a good mood. I was going to kill him, really, if he didn't tell me what the damned answer that was. And I said, what about this man, the woman, the motel, and the honesty bit? I said, how's it fit? He said, do you mean to tell me you haven't figured that out yet? It's annoying. He said, young man, you surprised me. He said, if they'd have been honest, they would not have been there. And that had never occurred to me. Honesty is integrity. Honesty is action. And action is the magic word in AA. Truth deals with facts. Somebody can tell you the truth, and they are not honest simply because they're telling you the truth. 
So if somebody tells you they're a thief and you invite them home with you and they steal every damn thing you got, don't go to an AA meeting complaining about them. They didn't tell you they were honest. They told you it was a thief. Thieves steal. If you keep it simple, this thing will work. If you don't, it might not. But honesty and integrity are identical to the same thing. And when you understand what honesty is, you will not take anything that's not yours to rightfully have. No man's woman, no man's gold, nothing. If it is not yours, you will not touch it. Integrity. Now let at the ABCs where we stop reading. A fundamental remarkable thing happened. It says, being convinced we were at step three, and step three is italicized. A little further over in that same chapter, it says this is step four. Step four is also italicized. There are two steps in how it works. Three and four. Trust God. Clean house. Now, when you get into that fourth step, you'll find out there are fundamentally two kinds of people in this way of life. Those you cannot make take a fourth step, and those you cannot keep from taking a fourth step. I asked a guy once, when should you take the fifth step? He said, when the statute of limitations run out. Sounds like a good idea to me, so I figure if you don't take a fourth, you don't have to take a fifth, right? So for a long time, I never took a fourth step. For a long time. And one day, this adversary of mine cut up with me, and he said, young man, you've been preloading off us long enough. Time you took an inventory. So I took an inventory. Wrote it out in longhand. Seen the syntax was right. Punctuated it properly. Edited it somewhat for readability. Put a little long sleeve, loose leaf notebook like this and handed it to him. Added a little addendum with that resentment list they talk about in there too. He looked at it. He said, what's this? A movie script? I said, no sir, that's my inventory. He opened it up, thumbed through it. He said, that's not your inventory. He said, that's a movie script. I'm an actor. I know a script when I see one. He handed it back to me. I said, that is not a movie script. That is my inventory. He said, it is not. I said, it is. He said, it is not. He said, what you've done, my young friend, is itemized your behavioral patterns. And I have no doubt that you have edited it so damn well that neither you nor I will ever know how you was ever wrong about anything. With that, he reached in his coat pocket, took out a small notebook, tore out one sheet, handed it to me, he said, take your inventory on this. I said, I can't. It's too small. He said, it is not. I said, it is too. He said, it is not. He said, tell me, my young friend, did you ever knowingly take anything that did not belong to you? I said, of course I have. You know that. He said, and write down thief. He said, have you ever told a story you knew did not match the facts in the case? I said, yeah, you know that too. He said, then write down liar. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like the way this damned inventory was starting to turn out. He said, you ever played around with the girls when you was married to someone else? I said, yeah, you know that too. He said, then write down cheat. Started to walk away, and he said, oh, incidentally, at the top of that page, right down, atheist. I said, I told you I was a Baptist. He said, what's the difference? Now, that sounded like a smart remark, but I'll tell you what happened. When he said that, I begin to see that a deep-seated religious conviction is quite often a tremendous obstacle to a spiritual concept. Have you ever had someone or heard someone say, if you're not a good Baptist, what the hell good are you? If you're not a good Catholic, you ain't no good at all. And the greatest of all spiritual concepts cannot exist. Our Father. It's two words long, and it cannot exist because of that one damn thing about religious tenet. Our Father. When it's our Father, there's no more young or old, rich or poor, black or white, Chicanos or Yankees or men or women. They're just people, troubled, people who need help. Some are somewhat dangerous, I'll admit to that. But they need and are worthy of the help you're capable of giving them. And now our Father exists. And you will be different than you have ever been. All because of two simple words. Our Father. Our Father. There's one more word in that step that puzzles a lot of people, and that's called a resentment. You know what a resentment fundamentally is? A resentment is the courage of a coward. And you get a resentment because someone done or you think someone done something that's detrimental to you and you'll do absolutely nothing but think about it. And the more you think, the worse it gets. And it isn't long before you're filled with a burning rage ready to kill and that son of a bitch is out there enjoying life. Resentments, real or imagined, have the power to actually kill. Many years ago, when I was going to school, I read Shakespeare's Caesar. 
And there's one phrase in there I hope I never forget. Caesar's describing some things he's planning on doing, and a friend of his says, Beware, Caesar, beware. And Caesar says, A coward dies many times before his death. The valiant never taste of death but once. How many times do you want to die? Is once enough? Or do you want to do it over and over and over? You remember what that serenity prayer said? You know, in my life, if I could not approve of something, I could not accept it. There's a hell of a lot of things in and out of AA I do not approve of. But that little prayer doesn't say one damn thing about my approval. Does it? it says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. It doesn't say to grant me acceptance, but peace of mind. Enough peace of mind to live with what is. You know what the next line says? The courage to change the things I can. The last one probably ought to say in a sponsor that knows the difference, but I guess it's all right the way it's written. Now, I jumped over step two purposely so I could come back to it. Or step three, read it. You ever read that step? That we made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. You know how many times I've had somebody come up to me and they say, well, I've turned my will and my life over to care of God. Now he's going to go to work for me. I'll tell you something. I spent a few years of my young life in seminary, and I read the Bible a few times. And there's a record in there of God having gotten a job working six days and six nights, creating the heavens and the earth. He took a day off, and there's absolutely no record he ever went to work again for anyone for any reason whatsoever. None. No, God is not going to go to work for you. You, my friends, are going to go to work for God. Do you remember the last time you turned your will and your life over to what's-her-name, whoever she was, who went to work, you or her? If you don't believe that, Monday morning when it rolls around, walk into the boss and do it in the morning. Hell, I don't care. Go up to the boss and say, from now on, you're working for me. And watch what happens to you. <laughs> now, one remarkable thing does happen. Would you do God's work as you believe he would have you do his work? You'll find out now the worst you can do is break even where before that's the best you could possibly have hoped for. Oh, things still go wrong. So Sobriety is not immunity. It says in the Bible that it rains on the just and the unjust. And if the best member in this group walked outside and the worst member walked out with him as raining out there, both would get wet. So it rains on the just and the unjust. But I'll tell you what happens. Things that go wrong now when your car runs out of gas, it's right across the street from a filling station. And when you find out your brakes aren't working, you're in a driveway at home. And when something else goes wrong, it's easy to fix it. Tonight, you know what happened? A little hose on my wife's car broke. I had to drive all the way over to Simi Valley and fix it and get out here by 8 o'clock. And I got here 10 minutes late. Oh, you see, there's still trouble. But my God, what would it have been like before? It would have happened on the damn freeway 20 miles from nowhere. And she couldn't have got hold of me. And I would have known where the hell she was, and I wouldn't have got here. The worst you can do now is break even. It's the, the best you could have ever hoped for. But because it does rain on the just and the unjust, bad things happen. They tell you in this book they will. But you'll have the serenity to live with the calamity of your life if you are doing this program the way it should be done. And you'll hear a lot of people tell you to work, work, work. Don't bother working. Try living these steps. Spiritual life with us is not a theory. We have to live it. I've seen people work these steps till they worked them to death and ended up drunk. You know what they didn't do? They never lived it. They just never bothered to live it. So simple when you keep it simple. So difficult when you don't. <coughs> when you read the next chapter in this book, it's titled Into Action. And every step, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, are all italicized and itemized in order in that one chapter. And a couple of those steps, they only devote a paragraph to them because they feel by now you have attained this dignity that it takes to do what you know you must do without having a whole bunch of instructions to clutter your mind. And they close that chapter by saying, we will now devote the next chapter entirely to the 12 step working with others. And they do. And fundamentally, that's the basic text of A. At least that's as far as I read for a while, because 
well, at this time in my life, I didn't have a wife, and I did not want a wife. So I never bothered reading the chapter to the wives. But I got news for you, fellas. If you are sober in AA, you damn well better read that chapter to wives, because you're probably going to get a wife, whether you want one or not. If I had not have read it, there are four types of alcoholics I would have known absolutely nothing about. In the doctor's opinion, there are five types. In the basic text, there's one more type. That's ten types of alcoholics who were known when this book was published in 1939. And God only knows how many types there are today. And if that's not enough to get us over our bigotry, it says, if you didn't drink like I drank, you're not an alcoholic. I don't know what would be. You know what Silkworth said about that? He said, these types and many others have but one thing in common. When they start to drink, the phenomena of craving develops. So we come from all different walks of life. Many of us would never have mixed if we do here. I think of Alcoholics Anonymous and the people in it as a whole bunch of misfits. Little parts left over from a thousand million jigsaw puzzles. None of them fitting together anywhere, but they fit together here extremely well. I fit with the misfits extremely well. But don't you? What about the family app? I never bothered reading that. I, uh, I'll tell you something. You might not want a family, but you're not going to find a 40-year-old virgin orphan in AA, so you're probably going to get a family whether you want one or not. <laughs> I got three daughters. My wife's got one. That's four daughters. I would rather raise saber-toothed tigers than daughters. <laughs> so we get along remarkably well. We're separated by great distances, and this helps immeasurably. There's something else I wouldn't have known if I had not have read that chapter. You know, it's okay to live in a good home, drive a good car, have money in the bank, wear decent clothes. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It says the material is all right, as long as it always follows the spiritual, but never precedes it. First things first. God first. Then me. And then those around me in the order of importance to me. And if you adopt that principle, you will find out that you will live different. Nothing should come in front of God, and nothing should come between you and God. No one, not her, not him, no one. God first, then me, and then you. But that applies to you too, doesn't it? And then if you find a girl, you'll find out that the best you can ever do in her life is come in third. And if when you can only come in third, what's the rush? No struggle to be second now, and you're not telling her how to live her life and what she should do for you. And I have never in my life told my wife ever what was good for her. I told her what was good for me. And I told her I was going to tell her that. And if she let me work her program for her, she'd make one hell of a mistake. She never did, incidentally. Not to this day. I've heard a lot of people say, hey, marriages don't work. That's bullshit. They'll work better than any other kind of marriage if you're living this way of life because the selfishness will have disappeared. It will have disappeared. If you're not, it won't work. No business will work either based on selfishness. That ever occurred to you? I've been married to Beverly for 17 years, and both of us were sober when we got married. And both of us are still sober. I think she's got a Mickey Mouse program, but she'll fight me over that one. It doesn't make any difference what I think, does it? I'll work better than any other kind of marriage if you're living this way of life because the selfishness will have disappeared. It will have disappeared. If you're not, it won't work. No business will work either based on selfishness. That ever occurred to you? I've been married to Beverly for 17 years, and both of us were sober when we got married. And both of us are still sober. I think she's got a Mickey Mouse program, but she'll fight me over that one. It doesn't make any difference what I think, does it? I keep my fingers out of it. That's all I'm supposed to do. To the employer. God, I'm glad I'm retired. <clears throat> Money was never an incentive for me to work anyway. Poverty has always been an incentive for me to work. Not money. There's something else I would not have known if I had not have read that chapter. You know what the five greatest enemies the alcoholic are? Resentment, jealousy, envy, frustration, and the third most common word in all known languages, 
including Mandarin, Chinese, and Russian. Fear. That's common. The third most common used word. How does Alcoholics Anonymous remove fear? It doesn't. What it does is it removes the causes of fear, the ingredients that it takes to make up fear. And the most common cause of fear <coughs> is called embarrassment. And you will not take part in your own recovery because you're so afraid you're going to embarrass yourself. Hell, you will. I'll tell you right now, you will. I said once in a meeting, I've done everything there is to do except make love to another man. The other guy in the meeting said, if you've had as many blackouts as you say you had, how do you know you didn't? So you see, you'll embarrass yourself. But by taking part in your own recovery, you get over that embarrassment. And then you can say what needs to be said, when it needs to be said, and keep your damn mouth shut if it doesn't have to be said. All because you got over embarrassment. What about retribution? How does AA take care of that one? You know, most of us are scared to death that somebody's going to do to us what we've already done to someone else. Retribution. How does AA handle it? I'll tell you. Did you ever hear steps eight and nine? When you go to all the people that you have harmed, now with dignity, not to apologize, but with dignity, you're going to set a wrong right if you can. And you're saying, what can I do to set this wrong right? Not retribution now, but with honor and dignity, you're not going up there as a scapegoat or a butt boy. You're not going up there as a dish rag. You're not going to go apologize. Hell, there's... Twenty-some amendments to the Constitution of this country, not one of them, says we're sorry we wrote it. An amend is a change that takes place within you that gives you this dignity to go back and set now a wrong right and leave a good taste in someone's mouth instead of a bad one that was there before. You're doing it for their benefit and yours. But their benefit must come first because except when to do so would injure them or others, it's exceedingly important. Don't be in a hurry. Loneliness. How does Alcoholics Anonymous overcome this one? You know, you girls, most of you, have gotten yourselves into trouble you would have never gotten into if it hadn't have been for just plain damn loneliness. You have a hell of a problem with that. I'm sorry that men like me took advantage of women like you when you were at your emotional lowest. I'm even more sorry that many still are. How does Alcoholics Anonymous overcome this obstacle of loneliness? You heard a young man mention it here tonight. Well, most people don't quite understand that AA is made up of two fundamental component parts. The program as it is laid out in this book, and the fellowship. The fellowship's the other half. Did you ever occur to you that al uses the same identical program we use, don't they, Sue? The same idea. What's different? The fellowship is what's different. And when you get involved in a fellowship, you're beginning to live by tradition now. You heard it said here tonight, and I don't fully agree with it, about the traditions are to the group what the steps are to the individual. They didn't say it exactly that way, but that's the most common way to say it. I think the traditions are to the individual what the individual is to the group. And if these traditions mean nothing to you, this group will mean nothing to you, or no other group. And no part of AA will mean anything to you except what can I get out of it. You'll be coming back year after year, always with the same difficulty, always with the same problem. Because you never become a part of the fellowship. You never understand traditions. So our common welfare no longer comes first. You couldn't give a damn less. And A overcomes this if you get involved with a fellowship. And there you get involved in H&I, general service, intergroup, central office, conventions. My God, I met Keith down in uh, Memphis, it was, wasn't it, Keith, here last fall. Carrying the message of God to the heathens back here in that part of the country. Involved in AA. Just got back from Tulsa last week. And a week before that, I was in Nebraska trying to straighten those heathens out. Because we got involved in the fellowship. Do you realize how many of you fellas are dependent on somebody like Keith to tell you what's right and wrong for him so you can see better what's right and wrong for you? Suppose he'd have said, out of hell with it, what's in it for me? Do you think this meeting would be here tonight? Maybe. But maybe it wouldn't. Would you? Maybe. But maybe it wouldn't. Understand what fellowship really means. And you'll find that if you get involved in a meeting just like this, and if you come early to set it up and stay late to tear it down for those of us who are not yet recovered, 
you'll find out something remarkable happens. There'll be one or two people here you just can't stand. And then one night they won't be here. And you'll say, where's George? Where's Helen? Are they all right? And for the first time in your life, you will have gotten out from underneath the bondage of self, and you'll be concerned about another person's welfare, someone you didn't even like. And AA is beginning to work now. Beginning to work. You'll find that Alcoholics Anonymous will teach you that life is not a destination. How many times have we said, my God, if I just get this, I'll be okay. If I can just get that new car, everything's going to be all right. If I can just get that job, that woman, that anything, then everything's going to be all right. I said once, if the Rams ever get in a Super Bowl, I can die happy. They got in the Steelers like to beat them to death. No, life is not a destination. It is a journey. And Alcoholics Anonymous shows you how to take this journey daily so that you can live your life to the fullest and be content and happy with your fellow man. So you can learn to love the unlovable. So you can learn what love is. So you can learn that to love, to love the least is when you begin to learn to love the most. When you love these the least of mine, then you love me. I want to close with step 12. Did you ever hear that step? Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. Remember back a while ago when I said, if you've decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, you know what it is? That's it. Step 12. We try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs, every damned one of them. You may not realize this, but you are the publicity agents for Alcoholics Anonymous. And your conduct will be judged by others who are not in this way of life. So I don't want to ever hear of any one of you ever getting thrown out of a restaurant because you mistreated a waitress, because you demanded something that you didn't really need that bad. I don't want to hear of that. You'll practice these principles in all your affairs, or you will close the door on someone who may need this program someday because someone else will tell them, you don't want to go there, those people are nothing but a bunch of obnoxious assholes. I don't want to hear that out of you, none of you, not one when God had a message he wanted delivered on the face of this earth many centuries ago, he looked around to see who could do it for him better than anyone else. And he found a group of people over in the Middle East who were very stiff-necked and self-willed. They were the tribe of Israel. And he gave them the commandment of carrying the message of one God throughout the world. And in spite of all the shame, humiliation, and degradation that have been heaped upon their shoulders over these centuries, they've done it so well that there are only two fundamental religions in the world today who do not fully subscribe to the one God theory. And they're coming around, believe me, I know. I won't live to see it, but it will happen. Mark my words. When I told you a while ago that I was a liar, a cheat, and a thief, that I took a moral inventory, what I told you was how I had violated three of the Ten Commandments. And I could tell you how I violated the other seven, every one of them. When you take a moral inventory, you'll find out how you violated these moral laws that God gave to Moses. The liar, a cheat, and a thief. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and I believe I was the priest. Honor thy father and thy mother. Do you think my life was yours an honor to our parents, even if they did not deserve it? Was it an honor to them or not? It doesn't say honor them. Live your life as though it was an honor to anyone. I knew when Christ was born, he was born to carry a spiritual message, but you know, to save my soul as much as I'd studied, I couldn't find it. And then I made a mistake. I got into an argument with a woman. Now, I know better than to argue with women. Even when you win, you lose. I know that. I still do it, but I know better. And I was going to prove to her something was in the Bible, and I found that spiritual message. When Christ was asked, what is the greatest of all the commandments, he said, there are two. To love your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he had given us a spiritual commandment of love. And for the first 300 years after his crucifixion, this was carried extremely well by today what is known as the first century Christians, which was the format that the Oxford groups used, which were the foundings of Alcoholics Anonymous. But then Constantine became emperor of Rome and got himself a blue flag with a white cross on it and went off on a holy war. He was the first Christian emperor, put a little sign on the flag. 
In this sign thou shalt conquer, with killing his enemies. Cash flow became important. Churches were organized, and the message was lost. It became dormant. For 1,500 years, it just lay there. Oh, some people like Luther and others tried to carry it, but they were never successful. And once again, God looked around to see who could carry this message for him better than anyone else. And once again, he found a group of people who were the most stiff-necked, bull-headed, hard-headed, obstinate people he could find anywhere in the world at that time called alcoholics. In a blinding flashlight, he made a deal with one of them. He said, Bill, I'll make a deal with you. If you'll carry the message of love throughout the world, you will never drink again. And for 52, almost 53 years, Alcoholics Anonymous has carried this message of love, one drunk to another, so well that we have risen from two to almost two million sober alcoholics in this world today. You will carry that message in a world full of hate. And it will take every bit of the grim determination that you have mastered over these years, but you will do it, or you will drink. It's just that simple. And how many times have you heard someone say what I want to say to you? You loved me when I could not love myself. You taught me how to love you. And for that, I am extremely grateful. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.